I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. You are about to hear a strange story. Names, dates, and places are, for obvious reasons, fictional. But many of these incidents are based on the actual experiences of Matt Savetic, who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic. For nine years, it was a steady diet of treachery and betrayal, all wrapped up in a tissue of red lies. I lied so much I couldn't even believe myself sometimes. But even when I hated myself most, I knew that I was helping to expose the menace of red fanaticism. That's why I had to keep on being a communist for the FBI. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Sabatic, Undercover Man. as Matt Savetic, Undercover Man. This story from the confidential file is marked Capital City Square Dance. The bus was bringing me into Capital City, the state capital where my job was to influence the legislature toward communist slanted laws. At the Hotel Sheldon, I found a room reserved for me. In that room was a tall, thin, skull-faced man with deep-set black eyes that made me shiver. My appearance frightens you, comrade. Uh, no, not at all. Don't lie. Don't ever lie to me. No, I, I won't. Comrade, uh... Kells. You were sent here to Capital City because, as Secretary of the Civil Rights Congress, you have a position from which to act openly. Act? The party needs the passage of a bill. Hmm? But look Senator at Terry is a fellow traveler. I think you'll have no trouble persuading him to start this bill as a rider on a more popular bill, of course. Oh. To get the popular bill passed, they have to pass ours along with it. That will help, all right. But even at that, we'll need a lot of votes That's to get... your job. Well, you can depend on my organization. And you, I hope. Funds have been deposited in your name at the Citizens Union Bank. Funds? Well, no matter how much pressure we can arrange to be put on the congressman, there is a danger of failure. You will purchase us some additional measure of assurance that the bill will pass. Of course. Do we meet here? I prefer to remain undercover when possible. I run a penny arcade at Third and Franklin. In the recording booth, you'll find a switch marked Tone Control. Turn this switch on and off three times, then twice. Three times, then twice. A panel will open beneath the table. Inside, you'll find a tape recorder. At ten o'clock each night, you'll record your messages to me and listen to whatever instructions I might have for you. I understand. We will never meet in person except when absolutely necessary. <laughs> uh, a fact I'm sure you appreciate. Need a lift to the market building? Hop in, Matt. Hello, Frank. Thought you were in Washington. I flew here when the FBI got your report. Well, I knew it was important, but I didn't know it was that important. When the Reds start monkeying in our legislatures, it's top priority danger, Matt. The wrong kind of law getting passed can mean more trouble than a hundred pieces of sabotage. Yeah. 
Well, uh, here's a copy of the bill the party wants passed. I'll read it later. Right now, boil it down for me. Well, uh, skipping the commie double talk, the law says simply that no man in the state can be fired from any job, union, or organization for reasons of political belief. Oh, that's all the protection the commies need. Could that cause trouble? Orders? For a while, play along with it, Matt. It'll give you a chance to spot all the red activity here and give us their setup. But what if the bill looks like it'll get passed? See that it doesn't. Senator Terry, I understand you are sympathetic to the views of my organization. This is a copy of the bill we'd like to get started. Uh-huh. Well, to a degree, I am sympathetic. I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do, Mr. Spedick. Good. I see that this bill goes on as a rider. Yes, I understand, but it takes votes to pass. Pressure is being brought to bear on your fellow senators from many sources. Uh-huh. Of course, but even that may not be enough. Uh, we know that. And we plan to obtain other votes. You might know someone less in the public eye who could help with that problem. Well, there is one person I know. A girl. Girl? <clears throat> a very extraordinary girl. Irene Stannard. And she can deliver the votes I'll need? If she can't, I'm sure she'll know who can. Irene is a very uh, talented girl. Where do I find her? Try the Sheldon Grill later tonight. It's the focal point of Capital City's political social life. She's usually around. And how will I know her? Look for the most beautiful woman in the room. If she has red hair, you found Irene Stannard. You say Senator Terry mentioned my name? Well, yes, Miss Stannard, and I confess I like his taste. Why, thank you. That earned you the right to call me Irene. Mine is Matt. Obviously, there's something you want me to do for you. I'll bet you don't have much money. The nice-looking ones never do. Hmm? <laughs> you put it right on the line, don't you, Irene? Saves time and just lots of trouble. Tell me what you want, Matt. I'll tell you what it costs. Votes. On a bill, Terry is going to start how many votes will you need? A lot. Oh. oh. I'm afraid that's out of my league. I could get you a few, but... Oh, sorry I wasted your time. Hey, wait. Hmm? Sit down. Oh, my. You do act impulsively. Yeah. I could tell you who could get those votes for you. I thought you could. There's a lovely blue mink stole in a store window down the street. I'm a dream in blue mink. If I had to pay for it, it'd be a nightmare to me. Five to one, it's not your own money. In ten to one, I could find this vote getter myself without your help. Okay. Can't blame a girl for trying. Make your deal. Introduce me to this man with the votes. Tonight. Now. Help me get this bill passed. And when it is, you'll be wearing that stole. All right, Matt. I'll take you to him now. There was no effort to follow the beautiful red-headed Irene as she led me to a pink stucco palace sprawling over an acre of Capital City's most exclusive suburbs. In contrast to the quiet taste of Senator Terry's home, this one was furnished in the gaudy splendor of an oriental sybarite. And the monstrous, balding owner was all of that and more. Seated behind his desk in a brocaded silk robe, he looked like a great Easter egg. Come in, come in, Harry. No ceremony between dear friends like you and me. I brought someone to see you, Volman. Matt Svedek, Jason Volman, Capital City's leading citizen and most successful lobbyist. Uh-huh. Delighted, sir. And I. You came here for votes in the legislature because that's all I have to give. Votes on a bill being started. That's uh, right, and uh, frankly, one without much chance. <laughs> of course. Why else come to me? Well, there's no guarantee, of course, but within reason I can deliver what you need. For a fee. <laughs> a man after my own heart. 
Yes, sir. I do love a man who doesn't shilly, Sally. Yeah, I love you, too. How much? 25000 as a retainer for my services. Another twenty-five when the bill passes. More if there's trouble. And expenses, of course. Wow. Well, I'll have to let you know, Bowman. Very well. But before any deal can be considered, I must be sure your, uh, your bill is a proper one, understand? Now, your organization is, uh... I'm Secretary of the Civil Rights Congress. Ah. There are rumors that your organization is a front for the communists, Mr. Svetty. Well, it's, uh... Oh, but of course, you can assure me that such is not the case. Hmm? Oh, yeah, sure. Fine, fine. You take my word on it? Hmm. No questions asked? Of course, my dear fellow. I trust you. Mm-hmm. Then I understand, Volman. I sure do. <laughs> Him and his conscience. Bowman? <laughs> He'd help you pass a law legalizing murder if you paid him for it. Where are we stopping? Oh, I, I just remembered I promised my mother I'd make a record and send it to her. I can do it here in this tiny arcade. I'll go in with you and wait. No, you go on home, Irene. I'll see you tomorrow. But... All right, Matt. Matt. Yeah? I don't know what you're involved in or who backs you. And I don't care. Good night, Matt. Good night. Between the punching bag and peep shows, I found the recording booth. Twenty-five cents a play. Inside, I switched on the tone control three times, then twice. Beneath the recording table, a small panel slid open to reveal a compact tape recorder. I turned on the playback to see if Comrade Kells had left any message for me. Comrade Svetik, you have made progress. No doubt your visit with the lobbyist Volman ended in his demand for a large sum of money. This was expected. The party feels the passage of this bill worth the expense. Pay him. I turned the machine on again and picked up the microphone. Svetik reporting. Volman has 25,000 retainer and 25 more for the job. I must ask you to reconsider paying him, Comrade Kells. I believe Volman untrustworthy and a serious danger to the party's plans. I'm holding up payment until you reply tomorrow night. <laughs> Kells' knowledge made it plain I was being watched. So after a late meal, I went straight home. I knew my attempt at stalling the commie plan was dangerous, but I didn't realize how dangerous until I entered my hotel room and found the skull-faced Kells again waiting for me. I didn't expect to call on you in person so soon, comrade, until you refused to obey me. Oh, wait, I wasn't refusing. It was just that my impression of Volman... I the... couldn't be less interested in your impressions. Comrade Kells, I... You should have faith in your leader's decisions. I do. I wonder... And, Comrade Svetik, that should worry you. And I was a communist for the FBI and the second act of our story. The commie instigated bill was on its way through the state legislature as a rider on a bill known as S-1729. The red bill was worded in double talk with no hint of the pressure being brought to bear by a dozen powerful and in some cases innocent organizations to see that S-1729 was passed. The bill passed the Senate, and one person was not surprised. The lobbyist, Bullman. <laughs> and with six votes to spare. The House of Representatives will be tougher. Nonsense. The bill will pass. You'll see. 
I'd better. I'm paying $50,000 to see it. Mm, I've been paid more. And less, probably. But uh, I guess you make enough to pay income taxes. Please, don't mention those words. Svetik, $25,000 has been placed in your account to cover final payment to Volman. Be careful. FBI agents from Washington are in town. Svetik reporting. House of Representatives will vote on Bill S-1729 Monday. Your orders heard and understood. Don't worry about the FBI. I'll be very careful. Matt, hello there Hello, Irene Sending another recording to your mother? Mm. Oh, yeah What are you doing here? So you go in and decided to wait for you I was hoping you'd be glad to see me I, Sure, sure I am Glad enough to have a late dinner with me? I know of a wonderful place not far from here. No, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, I've got something that I have to do. Say, on second thought, I will go if we can stop by your apartment first. What? <laughs> well, what's so funny? My apartment. That was the place I was going to take you for dinner. <laughs> to your very good health, Matt Svetik. Salud y pesetas y amor y tiempo para gastar. Sounds nice. That means health, wealth, and love, and time to enjoy them. Oh. They're pretty wonderful, Irene. You'd better tell me why you wanted to come up here. I need to use a phone without being seen, preferably a private line. And one you can be sure isn't tapped. So, okay, you guessed right. It's over there in the cabinet. Help yourself. And I'll wait in the other room. <laughs> to the FBI, and even on the private line, I used code to arrange a meeting. I slipped out of Irene's apartment without saying goodbye, and a few minutes later, I was in the FBI office telling what I knew. Okay, Matt. Anything else? Well, you'd better keep an eye on Senator Terry. I think he's just a misguided idealist, but in his position, he can do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time to stop that red bill, Matt. We'll arrange to have it protested. That'll help. Too bad you couldn't have got to us sooner. Kells has had me covered like a blanket. I didn't want his men to even see me near a phone because when Kells gets suspicious, he's no fun at all. So, S-1729 and its rider has been protested, eh? <laughs> well, that's too bad. You don't seem very upset, Volman. I never get upset. Bad for a man of my weight. Besides, a bill can still be passed. After the protest? The representatives will be sure to read our bill carefully now. That will finish it. They'll never of pass it. Of course they will. I shall see to it. In fact, I have already made arrangements for the necessary majority. Well, if you succeed, I have the last 25000 The that... amount is slightly incorrect. What? Trouble causes my price to rise, as I told you. Cash in advance this time. Forty thousand. Forty thousand? Tomorrow night will do. Good day, Mr. Svetik. I didn't get Kell's reaction until the next day. Then, at two o'clock, a crisp ten-word phone call instructed me to withdraw the money in my account at the Citizen Union Bank and bring it with me that night. So the cash was in my pocket at ten o'clock when I entered the Penny Arcade record booth and switched on the hidden recorder. Never mind using this recorder, Comrade Svetik. Report to me in my office immediately. You have the money? Oh, yes, Comrade. Here. Twenty-seven. Yes, I can just make it. With what I had, there's thirty-nine, forty thousand. 
Yes, comrade. Then I'm to take the, the money. The money will stay with me. You'll return here at 11 o'clock when I close the arcade. Then you'll take me to see Volman so our deal can be completed tonight. As Kells talked, he stuffed the money in a long manila envelope and dropped it into the inside pocket of his coat hanging over the back of his chair. Watching him gave me an idea. And outside, I ducked the men following me and found a drugstore where I could buy a duplicate envelope. I filled the envelope with cut newspaper and took up a vigil in the alley behind Kells' office. Through an open window, I watched Kells preparing to close the arcade, then got my break when he stepped into his tiny washroom for the moment out of sight of his coat, still hanging over his chair. I had to be quick, quiet, and lucky. I was all three. When Kells came from the washroom, the envelopes had been switched, and I was outside, complete with $40,000 and a bad case of shakes. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Shall we step into the library? Thank you. Now, let me guess. This is the man behind the throne, eh, Mr. Svenik? Welcome, Mr. Uh... My name is not important. This is. Here. 40000 Our part of the bargain. Ah, yes, yes. Thank you. If the money is all here... It's there. Open the envelope and cut it. Let's have no trust spoiling our relationship. <laughs> oh, God. What kind of a joke is this? Joke? This. Paper. What, what kind of a fool do you take me for? There was $40,000 in that envelope. I sealed it myself and it was never out of my possession. That's all. You are paid. The party will expect you to do your job. Party? So you're a communist. As if you didn't know. This puts a new light on things. Good day, gentlemen. Not yet, Volman. Not until I Step have... Back. Look out, he's got a gun. Ignoring political beliefs, it seems obvious you have no money. Therefore, our business dealings are finished. <laughs> What's so funny? This is the first time I've done business with people as uh, untrustworthy as myself. If I hadn't been planning to swindle you, I'd be most annoyed by your efforts to swindle me. You, uh, you never intended to deliver those votes? My dear fellow, I'm not a magician. Of course not. That's why I requested the money in advance. You treacherous swine! Kells, no! <laughs> oh, stay back, Smitty. Look after your friend. Yeah. Kells? Is he? No, no, he's only wounded. Oh. Then get him out of here. Quickly before I call the police. All right, Foreman. Uh, pour me a glass of water from that carafe so I can bring him to. He's too big to carry. Here. Thanks. <laughs> You're not out, Bowman. But I'd stay on the floor if I were you. Oh, and I'll I'll pick up the gun just to keep you out of trouble. What, what are you going to do? You mentioned the police. I thought I'd call them for you. They're going to want you, Bowman. No, no, no. Oh, but yes. <laughs> Did you finish your testimony in the Volman trial, Matt? He's a cinch for five to ten. Will you be leaving now? As soon as I say goodbye to Irene. She's going to be mad about not getting that stole. <laughs> uh, she'll get it from someone else. Uh, you in trouble at commie headquarters? Not really. Those rules of tape recording I took from Kell's recording machine proved how I protested his trusting Volman, so I'm clear. And, uh, Kell's? The party's sending him to the Soviet for the cure. I don't like Kells, but I can't help feeling sorry for what he's facing. I can imagine the party's plenty sore about his failing to get the bill passed. Plenty. And Kells losing that money I turned into you made it worse. But it all goes to show that communism, like crime, just doesn't pay. <laughs> It was back to work as a commie. 
A brief moment with my FBI contact when I could feel like a decent human being. Then again, I was a red. Working with the party, being one of them, yet because I am their enemy, I always walk alone. Turn in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews. Communism is not a political argument, it's a hard, cold theory of aggression intended to end with what the Reds call their historic mission. That mission is revolution. Its purpose, to destroy everything you and I hold dear. It's up to us to see that it doesn't succeed. Join us next week for another of Matt Savetic's thrilling stories, won't you? 